Shalom and welcome to Yeshiva Pirkei Shoshanim in association with Nativ. My name is Davon Mays. And today we're going to be dealing with Leviticus 17 and how it has been misused. So let's get right into it. <clears throat> Clouds of Torah presents the misuse of Leviticus 17 and 11. So before we get into this, there's some background information that we got to deal with because the issue of blood, the issue of sacrifice, and the issue of things pertaining to the law have to be addressed. So if you're going to quote the law as a proof, then you should probably believe in this, this you know, certain law, right? If you don't believe in the law and quoting it as a proof, that's a, you know, usually an atheist does that, disagrees with the Torah, he goes into it, quotes it. But if the person is an atheist, we kind of already know his position. But when Christianity quotes the Tanakh, we have the assumption that it actually believed or believes in the Tanakh. Some Christians say the Tanakh is done with, the, the law is old, it's over with. And some don't hold that position, so I don't want to use a broad brush, but overall, at one point, either they believed in the Tanakh or they believe in the Tanakh. So let's get into this. So did Jesus repent of his sins? So why am I asking this question? Matthew 3, 13 through 15. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John <clears throat> tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. The Christian answer is Jesus was giving us an example of what to do. <clears throat> John is basically saying, I'm a sinner and need to be baptized by you. John was baptizing people before Jesus showed up. So this was not a problem if he was you know, if he himself made sins and it would be righteous if they both repented, right? Like if they're both, you know, repenting, this would be good on both ends. So what has happened is um, <clears throat> Mark does not present Jesus as a sinless person. But Matthew, which is, you know, after Mark, Mark was written first, according to most scholars, so. Uh, Matthew rewrites the story to make Jesus more presentable. And John does not, the book of John does not even have the baptism of Jesus. So we see the later gospel, the later the gospel, <clears throat> the more Jesus is elevated. Because if Jesus needs to be baptized for the repentance of sins, this takes away the whole notion of him being sinless, right? <clears throat> so the, again, the excuse is, well, John felt that Jesus was greater than him, but Remember, Jesus says there is no greater prophet than John the Baptist. There is no greater prophet born of a woman than John the Baptist. And Jesus himself was born of a, of a woman. So the fact that John says that, you know, he needs to be baptized by Jesus, he probably doesn't know how Jesus feels about him. And he didn't know Jesus, you know, said that he was <laughs> Elijah and other things because he denied that, too. So we already see some, you know, inconsistencies with this story. But <clears throat> so. Here's the question. Why would Jesus give an example of something that did not work according to Hebrews 9.22? And this is what I mean. Hebrews 9.22 says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Mark 1 and 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Where's the blood in John's baptism? There's no sacrifice attached to that. So did John not know that without blood, his baptisms were worthless, according to the book of Hebrews? Because he, see, here Hebrews is not quoting the Torah. Now, when it says almost all, th all things are by the law purged with blood, that's correct. Almost, not everything. But this last part, without shedding of blood is no remission. So that means John's 
baptism for the remission of sins would have been worthless because there's no blood. So if Jesus was coming to say, permit it to be so now, for thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness, it would have been a useless baptism if it didn't work because there's no blood. So again, why would Jesus give an example of something that did not work according to Hebrews 9 and 22? <clears throat> so one answer, and you can find this on a few different websites, the Christians are now digging into the Talmud, trying to find anything to support the blood doctrine. And what they do is they, they find pieces of information, but they leave out the context as they usually do. If you leave out the context, you can make anything say anything, right? So what they have found is a couple of different examples. Yoma 5a, Zabahim 6a, Menahot 93b. So here's one example. The Mishnah states, the requirement of placing hands is a non-essential mitzvah. The sage is taught in the Bereta, <clears throat> and he shall place his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to effect atonement for him. To effect atonement for him. So is, is that the context? Is just the placing of the hands? Is that what's going on? Leviticus 1 and 4, right? The Bereta asks, but does the right of the placing of hands affect atonement? Excuse me. So there's a question. Is it just the put, putting on the hands? Is that where the atonement comes from? Isn't atonement affected only through the presentation of blood? They say, see, gotcha. It's got to be the blood. Even the rabbis say this, right? So let's continue. As it is stated with regard to blood, for the soul of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to, uh, <clears throat> to effect atonement for your souls. See, this part is overlooked because Jesus' blood never came across the altar. For it is the blood of the soul that affects atonement. This is Leviticus 17, 11, which we're going to dig into. So what is the point of this conversation? What are they asking? Rather... The verse serves only to say that if you if if one treated placing the hands as though it were a non-essential mitzvah and therefore neglected to perform it, then the verse subscribes him blame as though he did not affect atonement. But nevertheless, in actuality, the offering atones for his sin and he does not need to bring another offering. So what are the rabbis really saying? When it says you got to place your hand on the sacrifice and then kill the animal and then the atonement, the, the, there's, there's, there's a process. You bring the animal, you put your hands on it, and then it's killed. Like it's a whole process. So the rabbis are saying, what if you don't put your hand on it? What if you, let's say, like, for argument, what if you forgot to do that and you slaughtered the animal and put the blood on the altar? Did you not fulfill the mitzvah? Do you get, does that person get atonement because you neglected to put your hand on the animal? It says no. In actuality, the offering atones for his sin, and you do not need to bring another offering. You do not need to do it again. See, it's the, 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 the context is treating the placing of the hands. Is this a, a severe part of the mitzvah? That's really the question. They're not talking about is blood the only way to atone for sins. That's not even brought up. Is it the only way? If you're going to do this, then that's how you do it is what they're saying. If you're going to bring an offering, you bring the offering, you put your hands on it, the blood goes on the altar, you get atonement. The argument is if you just put your hands on the animal, is that sufficient? Again, he shall place his hand upon the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to effect atonement for him. Is that the, is that the core of the mitzvah? So it says, but does the right of the place in hands affect atonement? So if you don't do this, does it, does it mess it up? That's what this is about. Isn't the atonement affected only through the presentation of blood? Yes, if you're going to do this mitzvah. If you're going to bring an animal and put it on the altar and sacrifice it, then it is the blood that makes atonement. It doesn't say this is the only way to make atonement. This is one example. 
Let's do another one. Menahot 93b. And with regard to the halakho of offering throughout the generations, the Gemara asks, from where do we derive the failure to waive the offering does not invalidate the offering. So we have wave offerings in the Torah. If you don't do the wave part, does that affect the mitzvah? The Gemara asks, as it is taught in the Brita, that the verse says, he shall take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for him. Again, they're not talking about the only way to make atonement. They're saying if you're going to do this specific commandment and you don't do the wave part, does it affect the atonement? Does the wave offering atone for one's sins? It's just, is it the waving of the animal? So then they ask, is an atonement accomplished only by the sprinkling of blood in this mitzvah? So which one is more important? Is it the actual wave offering or is it the actual sacrificing of the animal in, in the blood that's going to get to atonement? So again, for it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. Again, Leviticus 17, 11, we know this. And for what purpose then does the verse state to be waived to make atonement? So the argument is not, is blood the only way to do it, to make atonement? The argument is, what about the part of the wave offering? Just like, what about the part of the hands? There were steps. There's the wave offering. And there was the steps of putting your hands on the animal. If you skip the step, even though if you sacrifice the animal and put the blood on the altar, does that step negate the whole command? Is the mitzvah not performed? It teaches, oops. It teaches that if one deemed the ritual of waving to be a peripheral aspect of the mitzvah and therefore failed to perform it, the verse describes him status as though he did not achieve optimal atonement. Optimal, like the highest level. Nevertheless, the offering atones for his sin on his behalf. So again, the argument is not, is blood the only way to atone for sin? Because when they go to these sources... Again, Yoma 5a, Zebahim 6a, Menahot 93b. The argument is not, is blood the only way to atone for sin? The argument is, if you perform the whole commandment throughout the steps, is, does one little piece make the whole thing null and void? That's the argument. Because the blood still has to go on the altar, the animal still needs to be killed, but the waving of the offering, the putting the hands on the offering, these are the arguments in these sources that the Christians will go to to say, see, doesn't the rabbi say, isn't atonement accomplished only by the sprinkling of the blood? Yes, if you're committing, or not committing, but if you are observing this commandment, this is the process. This is how you do it. But it does not say this is the only way. Excuse me. So just to show you where people can take you, but you got to actually read what they're putting forth as evidence and go through it, walk through it, break it down. So what are the rabbis talking about? If you are performing this specific command to lay hands on the sacrifice, but did not do it before you kill the animal, or if it's a wave offering and you did not perform the wave, does the blood still atone for sin? That's the, that's the conversation that they're having. But again, it says, nevertheless, the offering atones for his sins on his behalf. Nevertheless, in actuality, the offering atones for his sins, and he does not need to bring another offering. So those two pieces, doesn't, if you miss them, they're not the optimal or the highest level of the commandment, but you still did it. Just like if you, 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 you're you going to give charity, but you kind of regret, like, oh, man, I really don't want to give this 10%. I'm going to do it, though, here. And you get you gave it. You performed a commandment, but you didn't do it with, with, a, with a real giving heart. So it's not the optimal, it's not the top level of the performance. It's not the highest level of the mitzvah. You did it, but you could have did it better. That's what it's basically saying. So 
cherry again cherry picking verses out of the town mood it does not help them at all it actually just shows them to be very deceptive when they do this because there's a lot of other stuff in the in the Gemara that they're not going to quote concerning the practices in the New Testament so just so you know so quoting yet ignoring the law so let's deal with this Leviticus 17 3 through 4 see when you go to Leviticus 17, don't just go to verse 11. Let's, let's walk through this. Whatever a man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or who kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people. Why is this important? Where was Jesus killed? Was he killed in the temple? Was he placed on an altar? Or was he outside the camp? And did his sacrifice ever come to the tabernacle of meeting before God? Hebrews 13, 11 through 13. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Was Jesus' body burned outside the camp? And was his blood brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin? This is Hebrews talking, not me. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Why would they want you to go outside the gate and outside of the camp if that's where the burnt, the animal's burnt flesh is? This, this is this almost like a waste place. You burn the animals outside the camp. Dung is outside the camp. What's going on here concerning this specific task that Jesus is trying to perform of sacrificing himself. His blood was not brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin. Right? His body, if he's a sacrificial lamb, you know, symbolically, was not burned outside the camp. So if you're going to quote the law, you can't ignore the law. If you're not going to follow it, then what's the point of, of quoting it? So disposing of waste outside the camp, Leviticus 8 and 17. But the bullock and his hide, his flesh and his dung, he burned with fire outside the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. So this was Jesus was taken outside the camp, not necessarily. And I'm not saying that they took him to where they, they, they performed these things when, when they took him to Golgotha. But the fact that it's outside the camp, if you're going to, because everything is spiritual and symbolic in the New Testament, right? That way they can avoid reality. <clears throat> this will still be spiritually or symbolically outside the camp with the rest of the waste. Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 14. Also, you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out and you shall have an implement among your equipment. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn over and cover your re refuse. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and your enemies over to you. Therefore, your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the camp. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp. So you want to go outside to the outhouse, to the trash, to the waste? Um, I heard something funny, and I, I don't want to. Some some people don't like to be um, named, so I'm not. I, I don't. I didn't get permission to say this person's name. Um, but he said, if Jesus was a baby and he was God, and he had a dirty diaper. <laughs> And God doesn't like to be around such things, right? The Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. Therefore, your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean, unclean thing among you and turn away. So if God's walking through the camp and he sees somebody's waste, he doesn't like that. 
So you really think he would have had a dirty diaper? Really? Y'all really think that that's how God rose? The Holy One of Israel would have a nasty diaper? Really? I don't, I don't think so. Those killed outside the camp. Leviticus 24 and 14. Take outside the camp him who has cursed. Then let all who heard him lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. So people who are disobedient are taken outside the camp and killed. Numbers 15, 36. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones and he died. So they took him out to the trash. They took him out to the waste to kill him. So why is Hebrews telling us to go outside? To go outside to the camp. This is where Jesus is you know, represented outside the camp. That's where they killed him, outside the camp. Just like these two people. So if you're going to listen to the law, listen to the law and put it together. He was killed outside the camp. These people were killed outside the camp for disobedience, blasphemy, and breaking Shabbat. Two various, very serious crimes in the Tanakh. Golgotha, where was Golgotha? Go to the Britannica. You see the link? First Kings 13, 22. But you came back, ate bread. <clears throat> you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place which the Lord said to you, eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Was Jesus buried with his fathers? Was he buried with David and any of the kings of Israel? Hmm. Jeremiah 22 and 19. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem, outside the camp. Not in the temple. This is for criminals. This is for people who God doesn't like. The burial of a donkey cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. What does it say about Golgotha and the Britannica? The hill of execution was outside the city walls of Jerusalem, apparently near a road and not far from the sepulcher where Jesus was buried. I didn't make that up. You can take that up with the Encyclopedia Britannica on Golgotha. The burial of a donkey dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. You shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Then we hear the hill of execution. Oh, <clears throat> my chair is making noise. The hill of execution was outside the city walls of Jerusalem, apparently near a road and not far from the sepulcher where Jesus was buried. Matthew 27, 33. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull. So, according to history, Golgotha was outside the city walls of Jerusalem where Jesus was taken, outside of the gates, right? Outside of the camp. <laughs> and he was buried near a road not far from this place of execution. So did he get the burial of a donkey? He rode in on some donkeys, right? And... <laughs> Dragged and cast beyond the gates of Jerusalem is what Jeremiah 22 and 19 talks about. Somebody who God was not happy with, right? Outside the camp, if you're really going to go into the Tanakh, let's go into the Tanakh. And we can see how it just opens up a can of worms for people trying to quote it to fit their agenda. <clears throat> But they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel, 
First Kings 2.10. So David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, right? So we know this is like an honor to be buried with the kings, right? Second Chronicles 28 and 27. So Ahaz rested with his fathers and they buried him in the city in Jerusalem, but they did not bring him into the tombs of the king of Israel. Then Hezekiah, his son, ran in his place. So you see there's, there's certain merits. Ahaz did get buried in the city, but he didn't go into the tombs of the king of Israel. So let's go into some context. Leviticus 17, 1 through 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, to his sons, and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp, or who kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man, he has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord at the door of the, timber, the tabernacle of meeting to the priest and offer them as a peace offering to the Lord. Remember Deuteronomy says you can't offer sacrifices wherever you want. It's the place that, I will, that the Lord your God will choose, right? So you can't just do what you want to do. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar, yes, and the priest, not the Romans, shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle meeting and burn the fat for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Burn the fat. Jesus wasn't burned, was he? They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after they have played the harlot. This shall be a statue forever for them throughout their generations. So we're getting up to Leviticus 17, 11. But starting at verse 1, we don't see nothing about blood being the only way to atone for sin. We see some other things being addressed, right? Where to bring the sacrifice, what to, be, what to do with the sacrifices. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons whom they have played the harlot. Basically, when you offer sacrifices to idols or things other than God, it's considered adultery. It's like cheating. So really, Christianity, when people worship Jesus, they're creating or they're committing adultery. And they're basically cheating on God and giving his glory to another, which we know is not, you know, good. According to Isaiah, I will not give my glory to another. So, <clears throat> Leviticus 17, 8 through 10, getting closer. Also, you should say to them, also, right? So this is this is what else we're talking about in Leviticus 17. So it's more than one thing. It's more than just about the blood, right? And you should say to them, whatever the man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who offers a burnt offering, who offers a burnt offering, Again, Jesus was not burned or sacrificed and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer it to the Lord. That man shall be cut off from among his people. And whatever the man of the house of Israel or the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and I will cut him off from among his people. So now we're getting into some context. Why all of a sudden is eating blood a problem because we're dealing with sacrifices now we're going to get into the blood of the sacrifice before it just tells you put the blood on the altar bring the animal you know uh it's got to come to the door that's in the meeting now whoever eats the blood why because blood serves a purpose blood has a function blood has um meaning behind it we're going to get into that. So anybody who eats blood will be cut off from among his people. Now, let's get let's get into it. Leviticus 17 and 11 through 14. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar, upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Therefore, I have said to the children of Israel, 
No one among you shall eat blood, nor any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. Why? Because the blood is only to go on the altar. You don't drink it to get atonement. Do y'all y'all see the connection? Back in verse 10, before we got to verse 11, whoever eats blood will be cut off. So if you're going to bring a sacrifice, you don't take the blood and drink it. You put it on the altar. So now when it says, I have given it upon the altar to make atonement, you don't drink the blood. You put it on the altar. So when Jesus tells you to drink his blood that didn't go on the altar, you are in violation. Blood is not to be ingested. If it's not on the altar, it's supposed to be poured out. It's not to go inside of you. That's because basically by doing that, by drinking the blood of the lamb, your God basically would have told you if that was kosher to drink this blood. If the priests were drinking the blood of the lambs that they were sacrificing, then you got an argument. But it says, no one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. You don't ingest this blood that you brought as to bring as an offering. It goes on the altar that makes atonement for your soul. So if it doesn't go on the altar, it can't make atonement for your soul. Just like we read earlier in the Talmud, when it talks about, is it the wave offering or is it the blood that goes on the altar that makes atonement? Is it the putting the hands on the head or is it the blood that goes on the altar that makes atonement? It's the blood that goes on the altar, the altar that makes atonement. But again, nowhere does it say this is the only way to atone for sin, like Hebrews 9.22 tries to say. It's just telling you if you're going to do this commandment, this is how you do it. Verse 13, whatever man of the children of Israel or the strangers who dwell among you who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten. So if you're catching something that you're about to go home and cook, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. You don't go home with your lamb you just caught saying, oh, this represents Jesus to me. I'm going to drink his blood. It's the blood of the lamb. No. You should pour it out and cover it with dust. Look, same context as verse 11. We're talking about blood here. The very next verse verses tell you. So if you catch an animal, you don't drink that blood. For the life of, the, of all flesh, its blood sustains its life. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, you should not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of the flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So this is not a practice that he wants anybody doing. He don't want you thinking eating blood is how you get atonement for your sins. No, you take that to the priest and that goes on the altar. And you burn that animal. You burn the animal and you do not drink the blood. So the proper use of blood is the context of Leviticus 17. Exodus 7, 17 through 18. Thus says the Lord, by this you, you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with, with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned into blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die. The river shall stink. And the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Why? Because it's blood. Psalm 78, 44. Turn their rivers into blood and their streams that they could not drink. You do not drink blood. You don't do it. We, are, we already knew that the life of the flesh is in the blood way back in Genesis. Genesis 4, 10 through 11. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth and which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Again, the blood goes into the earth. The earth opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. It does not go in anybody's mouth. It goes in the ground 
before the altar. The earth has, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. It don't go in nobody's mouth. And how does it say the voice of your brother's blood cries to me? The life is crying to me. The life that was in the blood cries out to me. We know that the life is in the blood. Leviticus is not telling you life for life because of the blood. That's not, it's not telling you this is the only way to atone for sin. The value of the blood is because it has life in it. That's not the only way to atone for sin. Again, the value of the blood is the life in it, for sure. But that's not the only way to atone for sin. Genesis 9-4, you shall eat the flesh with this life. I'm sorry. You shall not eat the flesh with this life. That is the blood. So what keeps you alive is your blood. If Once you lose all your blood or a lot of your blood, you're going to die. So the blood goes on the altar or it goes on the ground. So Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For the blood, it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. Not to put in your hands on the head of the animal, not the wave offering, the actual blood on the altar. Leviticus 17, 14, for it is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Anything you kill him or, or you stab it and it bleeds out is going to die. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh. Any flesh, symbolically nothing. For the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So if you symbolically drink in Jesus' blood, you're going to be cut off. Why? It don't say that. You making stuff up. If you're a Christian and say that, yeah. <laughs> if you're a Christian and say that, don't Jesus say, if you commit adultery in your mind, you're guilty. So if you're drinking blood in your mind, guess what? You're guilty, Matthew. Chapter 5, verse 28, I believe, right? I didn't, I didn't write that. Why is it why why is it so important to drink this blood? So it is a futile thing for you because it is your life. What is a what is not a futile thing because it is your life? The blood? Nope. John 6 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Hmm. That doesn't sound like what Leviticus was telling us, right? Hebrews 7 and 18. For on the one hand, there was an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. Excuse me. So if we're annulling the Torah. Why are we quoting the Torah? Why is Hebrews telling you there's an annulling of the former commandment? Because it was weak and unprofitable. But you're going to quote it to prove a point that without the remission of sin, there is no blood, even though it don't say that. You imply that that's what it said. But it was weak and unprofitable. So why are you using weak and unprofitable arguments for it to prove your point? Deuteronomy 32, 64, 46 to 47. He said to them, set your hearts on all the words. All the words I testify among you today, which you shall which you shall command your children to be, to be careful to observe all the words of this law. For it is not a futile thing for you because it is your life. And by this word, you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. It don't say by this blood. It says by this word, the words of the Torah, all the words of this Torah. It don't say the blood. And in the Torah, blood is not the only way to atone for sins. And if you haven't read the whole Torah, you probably don't know that. How do we know the words are the thing that give you life? Because it says, it is your life. What is your life? This word. 
right? Psalm 119, 109. My life is continually, continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your Torah. It don't say I don't forget your sacrifices. I don't forget to put blood. I don't forget to drink blood. That's not what it says. Proverbs 13, 14. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. The laws of the wise, how do you become wise? By knowing the law. What is the law? The words of the Torah. Proverbs 7, 2. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. My law. The law is not only about blood. Is it? Have you read the whole Torah? Have you read the whole Tanakh? Or are you just going off of what your pastor told you? Drink offerings of blood I will not offer. So drink offerings of blood. Why would Psalm say this? Their sorrows, Psalm 16, 4, their sorrows shall be multiplied who, has, who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer nor take up their names on my lips. This sounds exactly like what the book of John tells us. To ask for things in Jesus' name and to drink his blood. Ain't that what John kind of tells us to do? Right? John 14, John 6, take a, say his name and drink his blood. Whether that be symbolic or not. Well, let's let's get into some symbolic blood drinking and see if it's kosher in the Torah. Second Samuel 23, 15 through 17. And David said with, with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I shall do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things were done by three mighty men. David was thirsty. He was in the middle of some problems. And he needed something to drink. And three of his homies, three of his mighty men, went and got him some water. And David said, I'm not going to drink their blood. We know this is symbolic. They risked a life to give me this water. And what did he do? He poured it out. He didn't drink it. Symbolic blood. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? We don't drink symbolic blood. We don't do drink offerings of blood. I will not offer. Did Jesus not know that when he's trying to say, oh, David quoted me in the psalm. David wrote about me in the psalm in the Psalms. Well, this don't go with your, you know, program. No. We don't do symbolic drinking or eating blood at all. Why? Because we don't act like animals. That's what animals do. Again, John 6, 53, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Ezekiel 39, 17, and as for you, son of man, not Jesus, by the way, find out who this son of man is. Thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood of people. This is for people. This is for people to, that they're going to eat the flesh and drink the blood. Animals are going to do this, not people. We don't eat the flesh of people and drink the blood of people symbolically. Or physically. Ezekiel 39, 19. You shall eat fat till you are full and drink blood till you are drunk at, at, at my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. Leviticus 3 and 17. This shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all your dwelling. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. 
specifically. But God tells the animals, you shall eat fat till you are full and drink blood till you are drunk. Animals do this. We don't do this. Because remember, doesn't it say, or the stranger that dwells among you? No. We don't do, we don't drink, eat fat and drink blood like animals do. Specifically, the commandment of eating fat is not um, mentioned for Gentiles, specifically in this verse. So to clarify before anybody sends me an email, I'm just given the, the concept of there is no eating fat or drinking blood in the law concerning Israel and Jews. And Jesus' audience first was Jews. So let's just keep that in perspective. First, he said he only came to the lost sheep. Don't go to the Gentiles. Then he said, go to the Gentiles, which sounds like um, some modifications. <laughs> but anyway, animals are drinking the blood and eating the flesh. That you may eat flesh and drink blood. This is for animals to do. Animals eat people and drink blood. We don't do that. There's vampire bats that drink blood. Leeches suck blood. Do not behave as animals. Daniel 4.16. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a, of a beast. And let seven times pass over him. This is a punishment. You don't want to act like an animal. Daniel 5.21. Then he was driven from the sons of man. His heart was made like the beast. And his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. Did we talk about the burial of a donkey earlier? They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of man and appoints over him <clears throat> whomever he chooses. I thought Satan was the God of this world. I don't want to get off track, but <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3.18, I said in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of man, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like animals, which means you don't want to be like an animal. So that's why you're being tested to pass that test. So you can prove that you're not an animal. You can actually think for yourself and not be sheeple. You don't want to have a heart of a, of a beast. That's a punishment. That's a problem. So is drinking blood symbolically a sin? John 6, 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Remember on Lost Boys when Michael drunk David's blood, I in me and he in him, and great, now he can fly and he's a vampire now, like he's, now he's part of that crew, right? Because he drunk somebody's blood who was a vampire. Matthew 5 and 28, but I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Just by looking at her. So just by thinking you drinking blood, just by thinking you're eating Jesus' flesh, you already got a problem. It's a sin, according to Jesus. So why would he tell you to drink his blood or eat his flesh if it's a sin? Just like when it says that Manasseh made all Israel to sin, Jesus is making all his disciples to sin. Acts 15, 20. But that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from, thing, from things strangled, and from blood. Does that include symbolic blood? Acts 15, 29. That you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled. And from sexual immorality, if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Peace. Stay away from blood. Stay away from idols. Get them crosses up out your house. According to the New Testament, not the Tanakh. Well, of course, the Tanakh tells you that. But if you feel that the Tanakh is not valid anymore, Acts is telling you, leave them idols alone. Acts is telling you, leave that blood alone. Acts is telling you, stay away from things strangled and from sexual immorality. Which, except for things strangled, 
technically most of these things that they're mentioning in Acts 15, 20 through 29 are part of the seven laws of Noah. If anybody doesn't know that, these are all things already mentioned in, in Genesis. <laughs> so it's, it's not like, uh, you know, new information here, but blood, stay away from blood. According to the New Testament, you ain't if you don't rock with Moses. OK, that's where you at. But you can't be messing with this blood and drinking flesh or drinking blood and eating flesh or it's a sin. What's going on here? So we got Acts versus Jesus right here. Now, Luke wrote Acts, right? It's according to the, the, the scholars. So we got a problem. John versus Acts. Drink my blood. Acts say, no, you stay away from that blood. And spiritually speaking, you committed a sin in your heart because you thought about it. This is all New Testament right here. This ain't Moses versus John and Peter and Paul. This is John versus Matthew versus Luke. All right here. All disagreeing. Drink my blood. Oh, you can't do that in your mind. Stay away from blood. All right here. A lot of people don't know if, you, if you're dealing with Christians, you, you don't want to go back and forth between Moses and Paul. Just stay in the New Testament. It'll tell on itself. It, it does. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. First Peter 119, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. God, God said, I don't delight in the blood of lambs. That's not my thing. It's not like I, you know, get off on it or nothing. It's part of the, the ritual and the commandment. But he says, I do not delight in it, but I want you to listen to me. I desire mercy over sacrifice and obedience over sacrifice. What happened when Saul got in trouble? He said, oh, we'll just sacrifice it. God says, I want you to listen to me. Don't just give me sacrifices. Listen. Isaiah 1, 11 through 13. This, this, this is going to show you why blood is not the end game. Isaiah 1, 11 through 13. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, said the Lord? Why are you bringing me all these sacrifices? Because if blood was the end all, he should have been very happy with that. That's not what he says. What's the intent behind it? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. Excuse me, I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? I want some justice. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure the iniquity of the sacred meeting. Why? Y'all doing all these rituals, but y'all not listening. Y'all not repenting. Y'all not obedient. I don't care about all this blood being spilled because you're not repenting for what you're doing. Because if blood was the only way to atone for sin, then they could do all this stuff and still get atoned for their sins. He said, no, I don't want it. So when somebody tells you blood is the only way to atone for sins, no. When you bring that sacrifice to, to the temple and the blood is on the altar, that's fine. But if you have not repented for what you did to have to bring that sacrifice, you get nothing. That was a waste of time. Bring no more futile sacrifices. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or goats. I want you to listen to me. What purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? The blood. No, that's not it. No. Wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Wash yourself. That blood is not what cleans you. Wash yourself. The blood only works if you're going to repent. That's what it's supposed to do. When you see the animal killed and say, dang, for one, I just lost $300. So that already hurt. 
and I done took off two weeks from to walk from whatever, wherever I live in Israel to the temple. If I live far away on my donkey, on my horse, had to drag the goat. He didn't want to come. So I'm losing money and I lost some money just by sacrificing the goat. On top of I messed up and dang, maybe that should have been me on it. You know, not on the altar, but that should have been me who who messed who died for messing up. Even though all sins ain't a death penalty. But so before I get those emails, all sins ain't death penalty. But the, the point is, by bringing a sacrifice, that should get you to think about stuff and repent. So Isaiah 1, 16 through 20, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. How come we don't say, wash yourselves, bring a sacrifice of blood? It don't say that. And we still in Isaiah 1 where it talks about, I'm tired of your sacrifices. I don't want them. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are red. Though they are red like crimson, they should be as wool. If you are willing and obedient. It don't say if you bring the blood. It don't say if you bring a sacrifice. You shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you should be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. If you refuse and rebel to do what? to do good, to seek justice, to rebuke the oppressor, to defend the fatherless, to plead for the widow. It don't say if you refuse to bring a, a bull or a goat or a lamb or some blood. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Where's the blood? Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. So when somebody tries to tell you anything about the Tanakh and tell you you don't have to keep it, tell them they shouldn't even be quoting it then. Psalm 57 through 17, hear them, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. This is court. God says, I'm testifying. I got something to say. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house nor goats from your folds for every beast of the forest is mine. I don't even need your animals. That's my stuff. And the cattle on a thousand hills. David said, I can't even give you nothing because everything I give you, you already gave me. This is his stuff. We're not giving him nothing. Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and all the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. Didn't we hear that Jesus was hungry? So didn't they tell us? But God said, if I was hungry, I ain't got to tell you. The world is mine and all this fullness. This is my stuff. I don't got to tell you if I'm hungry. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? I don't get down like that. I don't need that stuff. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the most high. How come we don't say offer blood? Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to declare my statutes, Paul? Or take my covenant in your mouth. Paul, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. Book of Hebrews 7, 12, 7, 8, Hebrews 7, 18. Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you, what right have you even to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth? Don't tell me about no new covenant when you don't want my Torah. But you, but he written about in the Psalms. Come on, y'all. Let's let's be let's just be honest. This is all anti New Testament right here. <laughs> so no belief in the law quotes from Hebrews seven twelve for the priesthood being changed of necessity. There is also a change of the law. Really, 
Deuteronomy 4, 2, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So who told Hebrews there's supposed to be a change in the priesthood if Deuteronomy said, nope? Nope. Don't it say in Luke 16, 17, until all fulfilled, not one dot of the law will change till heaven and earth pass away. Nothing of the law will change. When did the heaven and earth pass away? So how is this priesthood getting changed? Oh, we're we going to quote from the, the Torah, but we don't even believe in the Torah to begin with. It was weak and unprofitable, according to Hebrews 7.18. So why are you trying to tell me about so much about blood when you don't even believe in it? Hebrews 7, 18 through 19. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Hmm. Deuteronomy 21 and 5. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near. For them the Lord thy God has chosen to minister unto him and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. By their word. So when did the Levites tell us the law is weak and useless, we don't need it? Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testament of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. Hmm. Interesting. Deuteronomy 4, 7. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason, we may call upon him. Why? Because they know that Torah. It is their life. It is not a futile thing we read earlier. So again, Hebrews is just quoting stuff. For the law made nothing perfect. But what does this word perfect really mean? Does perfect mean never make mistakes? Or does perfect mean make mistakes and get up from your mistakes? Is that what it means? Because it says Noah was perfect in his generations. It says Job was perfect. So if you want to come with the original sin, how could these two people be perfect if they got original sin? Because it's saying in Job 22 and 22, the Torah was involved. We know in Genesis, the laws of Noah was involved. How is this possible? If there was no standard, how can Noah be righteous? How? There's got to be a standard. How can Abimelech say, a righteous nation like us when he took Abraham's wife. Are you going to punish a righteous nation? How is they considered righteous if there's no law? They have some Torah. Genesis 26 and 5. Where did Abraham know all those things in Genesis 26 and 5? He made them up? Or was they already there? Zephaniah 3 and 2, she has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. Yeah, you cannot draw near to God, but that doesn't mean he wasn't near to you. You can pull away from him. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Problem. Isaiah 26, 9 through 10, with my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the habits of the Lord, the world will learn righteousness. When your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. It don't say grace. Let grace be shown to the wicked. He will not learn righteousness. Let grace be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. You can't give grace to wicked people who don't know Torah. 
You can't tell them you are not under the law, but under grace. They're going to stay wicked. Let grace be shown to the wicked. You will not learn righteousness. You are under the law. Now, there's different laws for Jews and Gentiles, but they still under the law. And again, if you're going to listen to the New Testament, till heaven and earth pass away. So again, we got Luke 6, 6, Luke 16, 17 versus Romans 6, 14. L look it up. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, not those who bring blood, not those who offer sacrifices. That's not the only way. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as has a contrite spirit. Saves such. So people who have a broken heart, God is there with them. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. How come it don't say blood? Isaiah 57, 15, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Doesn't it say he gives salvation to the humble? Psalm 119, 151, you are near, O Lord, and your commandments are truth. So God is near to people who listen to his commandments, not those who take up his commandments and put them behind them or not those who put his commandments behind their back. Like Paul. No belief in what Jesus said. Hebrews 7, 19. It's an annulling of the Hebrews 7, 18 through 19. It's an annulling of the former commandment, right? Luke 16, 17, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. So how are you annulling something? <coughs> how are you annulling something if heaven and earth ain't passed, according to Luke, writer of Hebrews? Hebrews 10, 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. He said it's not even possible. So does he believe the Tanakh? Does he believe Luke 16, 17? Whoever wrote Hebrews? Let's see. <clears throat> so adding words to a concept. Remember, he said it's not even possible for animals to take away. Let me read it again. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It's not possible. But he says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And what were they sacrificing in Leviticus? Was it people or, or bulls and goats? So that was just a waste of time. According to him, why were they doing all that if it didn't work? The same reason, why is John baptize, baptizing people for the remission of sins if it didn't work because there was no blood? Without the shedding of blood, there was no remission. But John didn't have no blood in his baptizing for a remission of sins. Because if it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul is the only way, according to the New Testament, John didn't have that. And why did Jesus go get baptized for his sins? Or why did he get, go baptize, get baptized at all if it didn't even work for all those people? They was just out there fronting. Because Hebrews said it's not even possible that the blood takes away sins. That don't even work. So, so that means Leviticus 17 don't even work. <laughs> really? Okay, let's see. So there's no eating of blood that goes on the altar, right? Leviticus 6, 6 and 30. But no sin offering from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It should be burned in fire. So the blood that is brought into the tabernacle meeting to make atonement in the holy place. Now, it doesn't say it take away sins, but it does have the word atonement, which means the forgiveness of sins. Because some people like to play word games. We know what we're talking about when we say atonement. So somebody's going to say, 
Oh, it don't say that. It say take away sin. It don't say atonement. But we know atonement is when you get your sins taken away. To atone, to make good, right? It's like paying a debt. So, again, we got no eating blood, right? No sin offering from which any of the blood from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned in the fire. Second Chronicles 29, 24. And the priest killed them, and they presented their blood on the altar. The priest killed them and presented their blood on the altar as a sin offering to make atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded, the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering be made for Israel. So when Chronicle says that their blood on the altar made atonement for all Israel, Hebrews 10, 14 said it's not possible. If it's not possible, why are Christians quoting Leviticus 17 and 11 to prove the concept about blood? And why is this blood making atonement in the holy place if it don't, if it's worthless, if it's not any good for anything? Why? Why? Deuteronomy 12, 16, only you shall not eat the blood, you shall pour it on the earth like water. This is the function of blood. It's not to be eaten. So we're bringing, we're bringing it back to Leviticus 17 and 11. It goes on the altar. Why does it go on the altar? To make atonement. That's why you don't eat it. But Hebrews 10, 4 say it don't even, it's not even good for anything. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Well, what does atonement mean? Because if you're going to quote Psalm, Leviticus 17, 11, it says it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. That's where you get your forgiveness for, from. Ask any pastor. What is blood for? For forgiveness of sins, right? Or, technically speaking, atonement for the soul. It's the same thing. We're saying the same thing. Don't let nobody play with words because that's what they're going to do. You're going to play with words. You ain't supposed to eat the blood. It's for you to get your sins forgiven on the altar repeatedly. Deuteronomy 15, 19 through 23. All the firstborn males that come from your herd and your flock, you shall sanctify to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. The firstborn shall not have any work done with him. So Jesus shouldn't have been a carpenter, y'all. You ain't supposed to work him. <laughs> if we're going to use the law, let's use law. When, when Christians want to quote the Torah, quote the Torah. Oh, yeah, we quote the Torah, let's quote it. All right. If he was the firstborn lamb, right, you should do no work with the firstborn of your herd. So he shouldn't have been, been a carpenter. You shouldn't shear him, right? He shouldn't have been circumcised because I made him cut and he. He ain't even valid for a sacrifice once they circumcised him. So he shouldn't have been working or circumcised if we're going to play those games. You and your household shall eat it before the Lord your God year by year in the place which the Lord chooses. Remember, God chooses where to bring the sacrifice. And he said, not outside the camp. The blood got to go on the altar. But if there is a defect in it, if it is lame or blind or has any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. You may eat it within your gates. The unclean and the clean person alike may eat it as if it were a gazelle or a deer. Only you shall not eat its blood. You shall pour it on the ground like water. So again, in so many places, the function of the blood is not to be eaten, poured out on the ground like water. And it, you can't bring it as a sacrifice. You can't bring, the, bring, bring it as a sacrifice because it's got a defect in it. If there is a defect in it, you cannot sacrifice it. So the fact that you worked Jesus as the firstborn and you circumcised him, you should he he's you can't even sacrifice him. 
if we're gonna use the Torah. So let's let's stop with the games. So what kind of blood are we talking about? Leviticus 1, 1 through 5. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle, tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. His own free will, not my will, but your will. How many times does Jesus say that, right? So it, he didn't even come on his own free will. So he ain't even a kosher sacrifice. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. Remember, we talked about this. We talked about this. You see, it, it came back around. Then he shall put on his put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. Remember, the argument was, what if you don't put your hand on the sacrifice? It's only the blood. Yeah, it is only the blood if you're going to perform this specific task. He shall kill the bull before the Lord. And the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar that is by the door of the taber tabernacle of meeting. They're not going to eat that blood. They're going to put it on the altar. Animals. When any of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd and of the flock. Burnt without blemish. Jesus was not burnt. He had blemishes. He wasn't an animal. And you ain't supposed to drink his blood. The whole New Testament falls apart in Leviticus chapter 1. Hebrews quotes Leviticus, but it can't get past chapter 1 when you're talking about the law. And he, what he supposedly did. Because it says we needed to change the law. But Jesus says you can't change the law. You got to listen to the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 23. No, can't change the law. Luke 16, 17, till heaven and earth pass. Even though it, the law is not going to change, but heaven and earth ain't passed. So you're not even listening to Jesus, let alone Moses. What can and cannot be offered? Y'all know this, but we're going to talk about it again. Leviticus 22, 19 through 22. You shall offer of your own free will. You shall offer. Did the Jews offer of Jesus or did the Romans take him and execute him? Was there a priest involved? No. You shall offer your own free will without a male, without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep, or from the goats. Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer. For it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever sacrifices a sacrifice, whoever offers a sacrifice of peace, offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow, or a free will offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed, beat up, crown of thorns put on his head, or have an ulcer, or eczema, or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Nope. Oh, Jesus was spiritually unblemished. Well, he gave false prophecies, and he, he wasn't a free will offering. He didn't do it on his own free will. Um, he told people not to uh, um, fast, which was... There's a lot of problems with that. And nowhere does it say any of these animals needed to be spiritually unblemished. It doesn't say that you had to bring a sinless goat. It doesn't say that. If we're going to keep the law, if we're going to use the law, then let's use the law. Where, where does it say you shall offer the sheep that was sinless or the lamb, the sinless lamb? It doesn't. So did you offer Jesus as a sacrifice for you? Any any Christian who's trying to tell you, oh, Jesus, you need his blood. Did you do that? Because it says you shall offer of your own free will. That means you got to bring your, your sacrifice of your own free will. 
you shall offer of your own free will. So who, who killed Jesus? Matthew 27, 27. Then the soldiers of the governor, the soldiers of the governor, who's that? Pilate took Jesus in the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. This don't sound like the priests. This don't sound like Israelites doing this. John 19, 34. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear and immediately blood and water came out. So the soldiers killed Jesus, not the Jews. Some people lie and say, oh, the Jews killed Jesus. No, they didn't. The Romans did. Now, guess what? In John 18, it says that the Jews had no authority to kill Jesus because they probably would have, and they would have never taken him to Pilate, and the Romans would have never got a hold of him, and the story would have been different. And since that's the case, who gave Paul permission to go around killing people if the Jews didn't have no authority to kill nobody? Side note. So this free will offering, Exodus 35 and 29, the children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord. All the men and whose uh, women whose hearts were, guess what? Willing. Jesus says, not my will. I don't want to do it. If I don't have to drink this cup, I don't want to do it. But if it's your will, which means it's two different people there, you can't be talking to yourself, talking about my will, your will. That's um, mental issues. Leviticus 1 and 3. If his offering is a burnt offering or burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He, will offer, he shall offer it of his own free will. You got to want to. Leviticus 22 and 19, you shall offer of your own free will. Free will. Luke twenty two forty two, 42, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will. But yours be done. That's two different wills. That's not a Trinitarian du duality. That's two different wills. Jesus don't want to do it. He ain't an acceptable sacrifice. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If it's not your will, you can't be a sacrifice. 1 John 3.16, by this we know because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He laid down his life not of his own will. And he didn't have to because you can repent for your sins. Oh, he bore the sins. Isaiah 53, did Ezekiel bear the sins in Ezekiel 4? Did Ezekiel die to do that? Read Ezekiel 4, 4 through 6, and show me where Ezekiel had to shed his blood and die to bear the sins of Israel. Does the Tanakh speak about spiritual blemishes of animals to be sacrificed? No. Luke 2, 21. When eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So circumcision means what? He was cut, right? Matthew 27, 29. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. Leviticus 22 and 22. Those that are blind or broken or maimed. What does this word mean? Karat. To cut, sharpen, decide. But to cut. The, the thorns cut his head. The circumcision cut him. You can't bring a sacrifice then. You can't. Human sacrifice. Isaiah 66, 3, New Living Translation. But those who choose their own ways, doing what they want to do, delighting in their detestable sins, will not have their offerings accepted. When such people sacrifice a bull, it is no more acceptable than human sacrifice. When they sacrifice a lamb, it is though they sacrifice a dog. So the lamb, the dog, it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. So no matter what you do, when you're trying to do your own thing and you're doing your sinning, your offerings ain't acceptable. When you sacrifice a lamb, it ain't no better than doing a dog. You might as well brought a dog. It doesn't work, right? Because it says you can't bring a dog 
as a like the, the money from a dog or a prostitute. So you can't use that money to 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 give to the to, to the temple or as a tithing because you know prostitutes and dogs have certain reputations in the Torah. People are called dogs for certain reasons. Not to say that dogs themselves are like bad because we know dogs are man's friend. It's the concept around it. Like just like when Jesus says, we don't, you know, it's not right to give the the bread to the dogs. Talking about the Gentile lady, remember Jesus called her a dog? It's not right to get a crumbs to the dogs. Call the woman a dog. All she did was say, Can you heal my daughter? He called her a dog. I didn't write it. Human sacrifice, Hosea 13, 2. Now they sin more and more and have made for themselves molded images, idols of the, their silver according to their skill, all of it the work of craftsmen. They say of them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. Footnote, or those who offer human sacrifice. Why didn't you just put it there? Why, why would you play with the verse to make it sound like that's not what you're trying to say? Let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves or those who offer human sacrifice. Why would you even, why won't you just put what it say there? Why are, this, why are these footnotes? Because they know human sacrifice ain't kosher, just like Isaiah said it. It is not acceptable. <laughs> sacrifice of the firstborn, big problem. First, Second Kings three twenty seven, Christian Standard Bible. So he took his firstborn son, who was to become king in his place. Now, if I read that to you without giving you no context, the Christian is gonna say that's Jesus. He took over from his father. All authority has been given to me under heaven and earth. And in Corinthians, he's he who was subjected to kingdom was given back to it was subjected to, and all that nonsense, right? <laughs> Okay, so he took his firstborn son who was to become king in his place and offered him as a burnt offering on the city wall. Great wrath was on the Israelites and they withdrew from him and returned to their land. So we see Israel was fighting the battle and the other king took his firstborn son and sacrificed him to win a war. What does God say about this type of thing? Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 32. When the Lord your God annihilates the nations before you, which you are entering to take possession of, and you drive them out and live in their land, be careful not to be ensnared by their ways after they have been destroyed before you. Don't be like them. Do not inquire about their gods, asking how did these nations worship their gods? Did they kill their firstborn son and make him an offering? Hmm. Do not inquire about their gods, asking how did these nations worship their gods. Also, I'll do the same. Me too. Don't be Mr. Me too. You must not do the same to the Lord your God, because they practice every detestable act which the Lord hates for their gods. God doesn't like human sacrifice. He doesn't like that they, he took their firstborn son and offered him as an offering. Why? They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Don't do that. Don't kill your kids as a sacrifice. So why would God supposedly send his son to do exactly what this king did, took his firstborn son and sacrificed him to defeat the devil, right? Jesus came to break up the works of the devil, right? To, right, to save you for whatever purpose, you don't kill your firstborn son and sacrifice him. Be careful to do everything I command you. Do not add anything or take away from it. Hebrews 7, 12 does not like that verse. So you're not supposed to sacrifice your firstborn. So why would God supposedly do such a thing when he tell you don't do that? See that you hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. Don't take up my covenant on your lips. New Testament. So what's wrong with this position? So let's let's we're gonna play word games. So Jesus was an unblemished spiritual sacrifice. He was physically killed by the Romans. He spiritually offered himself on the altar by God's will, not his own. 
So when you play in spiritual and physical red light, green light, you're all over the place. Did Jesus physically die? Yeah. Did he fulfill the sacrifices? Spiritually. Did he keep all the commandments? Spiritually. Was he a son of David? Spiritually. So he was physically killed to spiritually save you. You see where I'm going with this? <clears throat> no belief in the quote from Leviticus. Hebrews 10.4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It's not possible. Hebrews 9.22, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. How are things purified with blood if it is not possible that they can take away sins? Without shedding the blood, there is no remission. Well, if it's not even possible, why even quote it? You don't even believe it. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. There's not one pastor that reads Hebrews 9.22 and doesn't quote Leviticus 17.11 to support it. But Hebrews 10.4 say it don't work. He said that don't even work. Leviticus 4.20, he shall go, I'm sorry, and he shall do with the bull as he did with the bull as a sin offering, Thus he shall do with this. So the priest shall make atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. But it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. But Leviticus 4.20 says it does. It says atonement and forgiven in the same verse. So you can't play the atonement, the, the, the atonement forgiven gameplay, wordplay that we was doing earlier. The priest shall make atonement for them and it shall be forgiven. How? Because he took that bull as a sin offering and shed his blood and put the blood on the altar and everything you're supposed to do. But Hebrews 10, 4 said that that's not possible. So we see how the misuse of Leviticus 17, 11 is way worse than people probably expect. Excuse me. All right. <clears throat> so again, no belief in <clears throat> the quote from Leviticus. Hebrews 10, 4, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins, but 2 Chronicles 29, 22 through 24 clearly says, so they killed the bulls. The priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, they killed the rams and sprinkled the blood on the altar. They killed the lambs and sprinkled the blood on the altar. They brought out the male goats for the sin offering before the king and the assembly, and they laid their hands on them. And the priests killed them, and they presented their blood on the altar as a sin offering to make atonement for all Israel. For the, the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering be made for all Israel. Did it make atonement or not? Because it says it made atonement for all Israel, all these blood sacrifices. But Hebrews 10, 4 said it's not possible. It's not possible. Then why did Chronicles say it was? What does, are we being lied to here? In Chronicles and in Leviticus? So blood does not take away sins according to Hebrews. So why quote Leviticus 17 and 11? Ezekiel 45, 20 through 22. And so you should do on the seventh day of the month for everyone who has sinned unintentionally or in ignorance. Thus you shall make atonement for the temple. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, you shall offer the Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. On that day, the prince shall prepare for himself a and for all the people of the land, a bull for a sin offering. Why, if it don't work? Why are you taking your time to kill this bull if it don't do nothing? And who is this prince? The prince. Himself and the people are going to get a sin offering. Who is that prince? If, doesn't Hebrews say Jesus was the last sacrifice? So what is this prince doing sacrificing stuff? 
sin offerings. Hmm. Thus you should make atonement for the temple, and then you got to give a sacrifice for the people. Why? If Jesus did, he purified all the stuff with his blood, right? The answer is he didn't. That's why. So again, Leviticus 1.4, he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. God says it shall be accepted for him. Leviticus 4 and 20, and he did with the bull as he did with the bull as a sin offering, thus he shall do with it. So the priest shall make atonement for them, and it should be forgiven them. Again, Hebrew says that doesn't work. Leviticus 9, 7, Moses said unto Aaron, go unto the altar and offer thy sin offering and thy burnt offering and make atonement for thyself and for the people and offer the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord commanded. Why is God commanding stuff that don't work according to Hebrews 10, 4? Here's, an, here's, a, here's a blow. This is like a real serious blow issued by the New Testament to itself. Hebrews 10, 26 to 29. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That's a problem. <laughs> but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fury, fiery indignation, which will devour the adversary. If anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Yes, you get one shot with Jesus. If you sin willfully after you receive the gospel, which is their truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sins. That's it. You're done. Only fearful expectation of judgment. You're going to be devoured. How much a worse punishment are you going to get? Willfully sin, there's no more sacrifice for you. That's it. That's it. So my question is, what Christian has come to follow Jesus never sin after? Him? Who 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 went up, you know, when you when you little and you go to church and they'd be like, come up to the altar, everybody come and get re receive your Lord and Savior, your personal Lord and Savior, right? Your your own personal God, right? <laughs> Who's never made a mistake after that? Why is it why is that even the criteria. First John 3, 9 says, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So are you telling me you can't sin once you believe in Jesus? You can't sin. He cannot sin because he has been born of God. Hmm. 1 John 5, 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked ones do not touch him. 1 Kings 8, 46 says, when they sinned against you, for there was no one who does not sin. Ecclesiastes 7, 20, for there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. That's a little bit more like people on earth. This he cannot sin and does not sin. Now, if it said, tries his hardest not to sin, I'm going to give you that. Because I know some Christians who will overall try to be real good people. But to say that he can't sin or doesn't sin once they know the gospel, I'm going to go with no. That's not true. Sorry. I'm going to go with 1 Kings 8.46 and in in Ecclesiastes 7.20. And I'm going to go with when it says... The righteous man falls seven times, but gets up. But can't sin and don't sin. 
no. No, nah, you 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 overselling at this point and under delivering. I mean, you just you just do now you're doing too much. We just gonna go there with it. You doing too much. First John three nine and first John five eighteen. Doing too much. The golden child thing, too much. Anybody seen Golden Child? They know the scene. Too much. You're doing too much. So I got some questions on atonement for the soul. Exodus 30, 15 through 16. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less, less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make atonement for your souls. Atonement for your soul? Shekel? Hmm. And Thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for your souls. Where's the blood? If blood is the only way to atone for your soul, because it says those words in Leviticus, it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. Where, 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 where does this money come into play? Where's the blood? Right? Leviticus 17 and 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that make atonement for the soul. But we just read about atonement money that make atonement for your soul. Numbers 15, 28, and the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly when he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord to make atonement for him, it shall be forgiven him. So remember Hebrew says that you can't, you know, the blood doesn't make it uh, atone for anybody. It doesn't give any forgiveness of sins, right? We read that in Hebrews 10. Numbers 31 and 50. We have therefore brought an oblation for the Lord that every man have gotten of jewels, of gold, chains, bracelets, rings, earrings, and tablets to make atonement for the soul before the Lord. That's not talking about iPads and stuff. That's not kind of tablet it's talking about to make an atonement for the souls before the Lord. Gold chains and bracelets and rings? Really? Jewelry? Make atonement for your soul. Where's the blood? That's all I want to know. I just want to know where the blood is. Because Leviticus 17, 11 is saying blood is the only way. If that's what it's saying, Where's the blood? In Numbers 15, 28, and uh, I mean, not Numbers 15, 28, but Numbers 31 and 50. Numbers 15, 28 kills uh, Hebrews talking about, you know, the blood don't work. None of that stuff works, but it say right here to make atonement for him. I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. So again, go back and read Leviticus 1, 1 through 5, and then read Hebrews that says, it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to make atonement. So then why are they sprinkling this blood on the altar? Why? Because it says, then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. And it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. If that don't work, what what does work? And when did that not work? Why would God basically give you meaningless commandments? He's been lying to people this whole time? For the Lord your God has chosen him. Ezekiel 44, 15. Who's him? But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. Why are they offering blood if Jesus is the last sacrifice? And if blood don't work to atone for nothing? Deuteronomy 18, 1 through 5, the priests, the Levites, all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with, with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his portion. Therefore, they shall have no inheritance among the children, among their brethren, 
The Lord is their inheritance, as he said to them. And this shall be the priest's due from the people, those who offer a sacrifice, whether it is a bull or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder, the cheeks, and the stomach, the first fruits of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the first of the fleece of your sheep, you shall give him for the Lord your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. So if Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Ezekiel are talking about the Levites or the priests are the ones who do the sacrifice and bringing the blood to the altar. And Luke 16, 17 says it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Why is Hebrews telling you something different? In Hebrews 7, 12. It's a shadow. It was just a shadow. Well, it doesn't say that. That sounds very convenient. Because if it was a shadow, Luke wouldn't have said, heaven and earth got to pass away for it to fail. So when does this shadow fail? I mean, when, when does the shadow come into play if the law hasn't failed yet? It can't. And Ezekiel 44 is the future. And if you don't believe that, read Ezekiel 47 where it talks about a temple that water comes from the temple and waters trees that give healing. When, when, did, when did that happen? I'm sure the Romans would not have destroyed that temple if they would have got healing water from the healing trees. Their soldiers would have needed those in battle, they would have used that tree or trees. They would have had an incentive not to destroy the temple. They could have kicked the Jews out, but kept the temple. It would have been magical, right? So that doesn't work either. The shadow thing doesn't work. When we quote in Torah, of course, when we quote in the law, or if you're going to quote Luke 6, 17, you know, just... Whatever you want to use, we can, you know, we can we can read it and see what's going on there. So people are quoting the laws and they don't believe in them. Deuteronomy 4, 2, you shall not add to the, the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Hebrews 7, 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Excuse me. Well, we just read in, in Deuteronomy, Aaron and his sons. The priests, the Levites of all the tribe of Levi. Him and his sons. Who's him and his sons? That's not David and his sons. That's Aaron and his sons. So Hebrews doesn't even really rock with the law like that. Hebrews 10.4, it is not possible that the blood of goats, bulls and goats could take away sins. Hebrews 10, 11, every priest stands ministered daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. Never. It even gets, it doubles down. They can never take away sins. But Leviticus 4, 20 says, the priest shall make atonement for them and it shall be forgiven them. How? Sacrifices of bulls. Leviticus 16, 21 through 22, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, not the lamb, the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities. The goat didn't even have to die to bear iniquity to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. And what does the goat do? It carries all the sins of Israel away, and they're forgiven. They're forgiven without blood. Because it doesn't die. He shall release the goat to the wilderness. Now, there are some commentaries that say the goat is pushed off a cliff in the wilderness. Okay. Let's say that's an opinion, or let's say that's even true, because this, that, and then we're going into the oral Torah. So let's say that's the case. 
and the goat does actually die. Here it just says she released the goat into the wilderness. But let's say that goat dies and he bears the sin. First of all, it's not a lamb, it's a goat. Second of all, it still gets them forgiven. So it's blood that was shed, even though it's not shed on an altar, the blood of the goat, because it doesn't get put on the altar, but it does die. The animal does die. But it says that they they still got forgiven, though. But it says repeatedly the same sacrifices can never take away sins. And you lay your hand on something, right? As part of a ritual of a sacrifice, technically. But Hebrew says it's not, it can never take away sins. So no, Yom Kippur never worked. None of the sacrifices ever worked in Tanakh. Hmm. Is that true? They just was wasting their time. Because I showed you how the shadow thing doesn't work because heaven and earth have in the past to come into a shadow of things that it foreshadowed. So you can't take away the law until heaven and earth pass away. So when does the shadow part come into play? Conclusion. You are not to consume blood physically for atonement according to the law, nor think to drink blood spiritually or symbolically according to Jesus, Matthew 5 and 28 versus Leviticus 17, 10. Blood is not the only way to atone for sins with the sacrificial system in place. Read number 16, where incense was used to atone for Israel's sin. Read Deuteronomy 9 through 20, when Moses prayed that Aaron not be destroyed. Read 2 Chronicles, where Hezekiah prayed for Israel to be cleansed or healed so they can keep uh, one of the feasts. Blood is not the only way to atone for sins without a temple. Read 1 Kings 8, where Solomon says, pray towards his temple, pray towards the land to give forgiveness. Read Hosea 14, that tells you we're going to take the bulls of our lips for forgiveness. Read Isaiah 27 and 9, that says, when you get rid of your idols, you will atone for your sins. I'm not just giving you my opinions. Here's the verses right here. Hebrews 9.22 is not even consistent with the Gospels. Mark 1 and 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. No drops of blood. Matthew 9 and 2. Behold, then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on the bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Where's the blood? Luke 7, 48, he said to her, your sins are forgiven. The prostitute or the sinful woman, where is the blood? So almost all things are purified. So the honest Christians will be like, well, yeah, because almost all things, all, it's do, it do say almost, right? Then to say without shedding the blood, there is no mission is really not true because it's almost. But first we got to talk about things purified with blood, not atonement, not forgiveness, just purified because it says purified. What, 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 what is it talking about? So almost means not all, right? Skadon, nearly, near, Acts 19, 26. And you see in here that only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people saying that God's made the hands, made with hands are not God. So almost means not everybody, not everything, right? That's what the word means. So when it says, Almost all, all things are purified with blood. <clears throat> Almost is still not everything. Numbers 31, 20 through 24. Purify every garment, everything made of leather, everything wo woven of goat's hair, and everything made of wood. Then Eliezer the priest said to the men of war who had, who had gone to the battle, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded Moses, only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead. Everything that can endure fire, you should put through the fire, and it shall be clean. 
it shall be purified with the water of purification. But all that cannot endure fire, you shall put through the water. You shall wash your clothes on the seventh day and be clean. And afterward, you may come into the camp. Where's the blood? Because if you're going to say almost, yeah, almost. Everything's not purified with blood. And blood's not the only way to atone for sins. Read Leviticus chapter 5. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Aphesus, usage, sending away, letting go, release, pardon, complete forgiveness. What does remission mean? Right? Leviticus 5, 11 through 13. But if he is not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he who sins shall bring for his offering one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a sin offering. Fine flour. He shall put no oil on it, nor shall he put frankincense on it, it, for it is a sin offering. He shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take a handful of it as a memorial portion and burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by the fire of the Lord. It is a sin offering. The priest shall make atonement for him, for his sin that he's committed in any of these matters. It shall be forgiven him. The rest shall be the priest as a grain offering. So he get forgiveness without blood using flour. So when Hebrews 10, 4 says the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins, we sure read that flower can. <laughs> Bring some flour. It is a sin offering. It shall be forgiven him. The priest shall make atonement for him. All the key words, atonement, forgiveness, sin offering. No blood, though. Interesting. So there's no belief in the laws quoted. Leviticus 5, 5 through 10. It shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess. Yes. Confess the sin that he has sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed a female from the flock. A trespass offering or a guilt offering. Yes, a guilt offering. Not a sin sacrifice, but a guilt offering from a female of the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goat as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for, for him concerning his sin. So again, we got the priest making atonement concerning his sin. If he is not able to bring a lamb, right? So here's the, when we back it up, we back up. On Leviticus 5.11. Let's back up to verse 5. Right? You got to confess. Remember earlier when we talked about it's not just the sacrifice. If you don't confess what you did wrong, it don't do you no good. The Hebrews 10.4 says the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. But again, what about this flower? Even though that's not even though Hebrews 10.4 ain't true, which I showed. But it don't say nothing about that flower, though. Right? <laughs> it don't say nothing about that flower. And it says right here, the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sins when he brings the blood of an animal to the, the priest and it goes on the altar and all the things surrounding it, right? So Hebrews 10.4 doesn't, doesn't even... It quotes the law, but it doesn't really even acknowledge it. So we're going to back it up to that outsider comment that we read earlier. The outsider who came near was to be put to death. So for the New Testament to say Jesus is the new high priest, he's Melchizedek, he can go inside to the temple. Well, we just read only Aaron and his sons can go in the temple. Numbers 338, moreover, those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east before the tabernacle of meeting were Moses, Aaron, and his sons keeping charge of the sanctuary to meet the needs of the children of Israel. But the outsider who came near was to be put to death. As above, so below. As above, so below. Everybody heard that before. Hebrews 9.24, for Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear into the presence of God for us. 
But it say right here, the outsider who came near was to be put to death. And this is an eternal covenant with Aaron and his sons to go into the sanctuary to meet the needs of the children of Israel. Keep in charge of the sanctuary. The outsiders come here to be put to death. And if Jesus really believed what he said in Luke 16, 17, heaven and earth has not passed. So the outsider who came near was to be put to death. So that means if he got killed and resurrected and then went to heaven, they killed him again. Because the outsider who came near was to be put to death according to the law of Leviticus uh, or if Luke 16, 17 is true. Leviticus 16, 27. And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth outside the camp and they shall burn it in the fire, their skins and their flesh and their dung. So we're going to close on this note. You bring in a sin offering to make atonement in the holy place. Shall carry forth outside the camp. They shall burn in the fire their skins and their flesh and their dung. How did Jesus give an aroma and why wasn't his flesh burned? Exodus 12, 18 through 8 through 10. They shall eat the flesh on that night. What night? Passover night. Roasted in the fire. With unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and whatever remains of it until morning, you shall burn with the fire. So when Jesus was executed, they took him outside the camp and killed him, right? Then they put him in the tomb, supposedly. So after that first day, Whatever remains of this Passover lamb should have been burned in the fire. Nobody will claim Jesus was burned in the fire. Because that means they would have had to take him out that tomb. Which means he wouldn't have been able to resurrect after all them days. And he had a body. So he definitely was not burned because he, according to the story, he had a body. So if you're going to keep the law, keep the law. None of this was carried out. He wasn't burned. And his flesh wasn't burned after remaining a day, right? Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. But he really didn't give himself for them according to the law because he wasn't a free will offering. So that doesn't work. An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. When was he burned to be a sweet smelling aroma? That's what fires do. How do you know a barbecue is cracking off in the hood? Or anywhere, downtown, wherever. People smell that aroma. Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet. That is, I myself handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Jesus says, I have my flesh and my bones. Why didn't you burn him in the fire then? Because you remained overnight with your flesh if you was a sacrifice. You see what happens when you want to quote the Torah, but don't want to really quote the Torah? And Luke 16 and 17 does not apply, huh? Oh, that don't apply here. Heaven and earth passed away. Did it not pass away? If it did, when did it happen? Oh, it spiritually passed away. Remember the, 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 the uh, red light, green light, spiritual, physical game? That's what you're going to get on, 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 on this topic right here. Exodus 29 and 18. You shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. The sweet aroma comes by made, comes by fire. So how did Ephesians say a sweet smell and aroma? How? It's not even possible. So we clearly see the misuse of, of Leviticus 17 and 11. And with that, I hope I was clear. Um, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Shalom.